Hello and welcome to Climbing the Interfaces Ladder, lecture number three, Customize the Interfaces. So we've already taken a look on how to set up an inventory together with an interface. We've taken a look on some basic functionalities for our interface, the uh, machine interface there that we've been working on. So the next step is to improve this a bit further, to take a look on how we can customize this a bit more and, uh, well, just learn us more things about interfaces. So uh, well, we can go here to the code, but what I want to do first before we actually get started with any coding is to prepare a few things for today's lecture. So first of all, I want to take a look in the new uh, texture sheet that I prepared, or well, the new uh, texture. So if I just head over here to my textures and in GUI and take a look on this machine here, we can open it. Uh, what we'll see is a few differences uh, than, uh, compared to last time. First of all, it's bigger. You can see it's much higher. Uh, second, well, we have a question mark here as a fourth type. Um, then up here we have a few icons here. So those uh, few changes we will have to t keep in mind, like like so. So the question mark there, the um, thing is there, and uh, uh, that it's much higher. So we need to t uh, keep that in mind. So with the last lecture we had one machine and one machine two. So now we're ob obviously using machine like so that part. Then we need to change the Y size here to 218, that's the new height of the whole thing, like so. And then what we also have to head over and do is to go to the container. And the container we need to change because the player slots, their physical like uh, functionality part, uh, is not at 72 and 130 anymore, just because we made it higher. And the new um, height is 64 pixels well, higher basically, so I will have to add 64 to both of these. Or if I just add a new number, it's 136, and in this case, 194. So just to make sure that the slots are in the correct spot, like that. Okay, so what's next? Well, I, I've also prepared so we can add a new item. Um, so if we head over to item info, uh, here we go. We can see that we have these cards here. We have uh, card names, arrow card, border card, and cross card. And I prepared another one called the well, which is supposed to be called custom card, with the texture here, uh, card custom, like so. There you go. Uh, so that's just a new card, basically. And to well be able to use that, we obviously also need to head over to the block. Uh, block info here and add a new texture to its side. Here we go, here we have different sides. Machine side, machine side arrow, machine side box, machine side cross and finally the last one that I've also prepared, machine side uh, custom I think it's called. Like that. So now all of a sudden we have a new new item there, fourth type of card. And I'm going to use this to um, allow the users to set their own own like a drop settings. So usually when you use these cards you have like predefined settings like how should it drop, how should these things um, well drop. But now we can well have a, the custom card and um, they will um, uh, well then we can set the settings ourselves. And that's the point with this lecture to, to create the interface to allow the user to do so, something like that. And what we want to do is head over here to the GUI, obviously, and here we want to draw things. So what I'm going to do is head down in the uh, draw GUI container background layer, and just before we bind a new texture, uh, I'm going to draw some, some things here. So what do we want to do? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that the type is the correct one. So if type equals 4, that means that uh, uh, we have that custom setting. Uh, remember, we are already calculating the type, so that's why I can just refer to the type like so. But what do we want to do? Well, I want to define a 7x7 seven seven grid, uh, so we can define 7x7 seven seven anvils that a user can select. Um, so, um, how do we do that? Well, the best thing is probably just to make a, a nested loop. Um, less than 7, i is increased by 1. And then we have uh, J here that is also less than 7. So we basically get a 7x7 seven seven grid here. Like so. 
and what we want to do here is um, set the source. So where do we find this? Well, if we go back to the texture here and take a look, I am going to open it again. The the things I want to use, if we zoom in here, uh, are these things. So I have two boxes here, uh, and I'm going to use this first box here, the gray one with the gray border. We'll take a look on the other one in just a second, and also on this green box here. But we'll start with this one. Okay. And um, what I want to do is define the source X here. So that's X size, just because I put the texture right to the to the right of there. Okay, and and the next thing we want to do is uh, uh, define the rectangle. So why do I want to do this? Well, we'll see in a bit. But basically, I'm just going to, to define where this is located uh, first, and then we draw it using the this data. Um, so it's fairly simple, we just need to refer to the left side of the interface, add a number, and I've calculated that already. So 57 looks good, because then it gets sort of in the center of the whole thing. And then we add the uh, uh, 9 for each uh, time we loop through this one. So basically it's going to turn into a grid here, just because the uh, rectangle Y is the GUI top plus 70 plus J times 9, like so. so that's not how you spell top. Um, so it's going to turn into a grid, basically, where they are placed. So I each and every of these rectangles are going to be placed differently, and we will have 49 of them uh, uh, in total. So then I want to set the uh, width of this thing, so that's W, uh, and I want to set the height uh, like so. And finally, when I have all of these things set, I can set source Y as well. That's going to be 27. Yes, because it's put right uh, below the that green bar, and that green bar is 27 pixels high, as we can see up there. But now when we have set all of those things, what we can do is just draw, and draw, where is it, draw texture, textured model direct like so, and then we just give the information. So. Usually we haven't specified six different variables here before, uh, but there's a reason why I'm doing that. We will take a look on that in just a second. Uh, here we want source X, here we want source Y, and here we want rect uh, W, and here we have rect uh, H, like so. There you go. So that's the only thing for now. We're going to create a grid when we have this custom card uh, as the current setting and uh, print them out like that. This is obviously not too advanced, but we'll improve it uh, in just a second. I'm just going to run this. Let's see if it starts here. There you go. Okay, so here I have prepared already a little machine here. And what we want to do is uh, head over to miscellaneous, and here we have the fourth card. So well, let's grab a bunch of those. I can grab a few arrows as well. Um, and what I want to do now is just, well, we can take a look on this arrow card first. So nothing special here. We just see that the interface is much bigger than before. And uh, we can also see that these slots are properly uh, well, we can properly hover over them, just yes, because I increased their location by 64, just yes, because, well, I, I moved them down that much in the graphical part. But what, we, what we're interested about is this custom card, the question mark there instead, and there we go. Now we have this grid here in the middle of, of everything here. We also have that question mark, because I defined so in the interface. We can open that uh, if we so go down here. As you can see, I specified, there you go, I specified another one there, so it knows how to uh, show that. Uh, so therefore, the question mark goes there. And we have this grid. It doesn't do anything, though. So that's the next step to fix, of course. Right, so well, that has something to do with, with these things here. I wanted to specify those things right there for a reason. And the reason is, in my opinion, it's very, very important to... to uh, have some user friendliness, and I think if if these boxes change when you move the mouse over them, 
it's indicating that we can do something with them. And I'm going to zoom in here again. And we have this white one. So what I'm going to do is basically do it so when you hover your mouse over any of these squares, it's going to turn to the other texture here, the one with the white border. That's going to indicate that you can do something with it. It's not going to allow you to do anything with it, but it's going to indicate that. And in my opinion, that's a very important part. Then what we're going to do later on is so you can click it to select it, and then it's going to turn green. But that's a lighter part. So let's see if we can um, make it turn white. So how do we do that? We need to check if the mouse is inside the specific coordinates. But how do we do that? How do we get the mouse? Well, let's move up a bit to draw GUI container background layer. We have three parameters here that we have totally ignored so far. And we're going to ignore the first one still. We're probably not going to use that at all. Um, but we have X and Y here, and that's the coordinates of the mouse when you're drawing things. So um, uh, what we want to do now is yet just head over to um, here and check if that coordinate X and Y is inside a, the rectangle. So how do we do this? Well, checking if a specific point is inside a rectangle is fairly simple. That's why you always use, or well not always, but if you want to have fast calculations with collection boxes, you use collections with, with squares. If you want, uh, want to do three dimensions, you have cuboids, of course. So it's fairly simple to just check if this point is inside a rectangle. And what I'm going to do is the following. So we get the rectangle X. That's the very uh, left border of this rectangle left edge and we want to make sure that the x coordinate is equal to that or greater so it's basically on the left edge or further to the to the right that's the first step the next step is of course to check that the x coordinate is also on the right edge or further to the left so basically what we're checking here we do it like that that's the right edge. So we take the left edge plus the width. So if we do it like that uh, and actually do it properly, uh, what we'll get is we're checking if x is between the left and the right sides. sides uh, the edge is there. So if it's in between those, that means that we're actually having x in, in uh, well, in the rectangle while well, x-wise. The y-value can still be wrong. So we will have to do the exact same thing with the y-value. Rect y is smaller than or equals to y so that's the mouse. Um, then we want that y should be less than or equals to rect y plus rect h, like that. Here we go. Oops. Source x plus equals h. So what's going on here? Well, I'm checking that the x coordinate of the mouse is inside. Uh, well, within the, the left and right border, and I check that the y coordinate of the mouse is within the top and bottom border, uh, which is going to basically check is this mouse inside this rectangle, and if so, we just do this simple calculation. We increase it by 8. The source, we increase by 8. Why do I do that? Well, let's take a look at the texture. We have this white version here. One of these blocks are 8 by 8. That means that if we increase the source location by 8, we're going to start drawing it here instead. That means that we're going to get the gray with the white border rather than the rather than the gray with the gray border, and that's going to give a big difference in the result. Well, let's take a look. There you go. And now if we take a look here, when I move my mouse over here, that annoying achievement, uh, it's going to change the color. Yes, because it detects, all right, the mouse is inside the coordinates here of this, well, the, these bounds of this block, oh, not block, but the, but the little rectangle here, and therefore it's going to use the other texture there. So I think this is a very important part uh, of um, making nice and user-friendly interfaces to sort of indicate for the user that it's sort of doing the correct thing. When we move the mouse here, it means, all oh, right, we should actually do this. It has something to do with, with us moving the mouse here. So it's going to indicate that, all oh, right, we're probably supposed to click here. So it's a nice little graphical part there, but I also think it's very important for user friendliness. So it's, there you go. But I'm not going to set it up like I've done here. It works for now for what we're doing here, but if we want to expand it, it's it's not really that good. Yes, because we're defining the rectangle in here, and that means that, well, if we need a rectangle somewhere else as well, 
we're sort of in trouble because well then we will have to define it there as well so what I'm going to do is just set up a class that is going to handle this for us new class like so and I'm going to call this GUI rectangle like so and this hasn't anything to do with with any Minecraft stuff it's just a, my own class that I want to set up here and to start with I want to wanted to store the x coordinate the y coordinate the uh, width and the height like so and when we create it then those are the things um, I want to get so we'll see why this comes in handy um, pretty soon but the reason why I do this is simply so we can bother less about exactly what we're doing all the time and we can just make a class that handles that for us for instance when we want to check if the code um, well if the mouse coordinate in, is inside a rectangle we don't have to type that code all the time like is it w within the x and y well the left and right border the top and uh, bottom border and so on um, it would be much easier to just call a method all the time and uh, that's sort of what this is going to do. It's going to help us along uh, with setting everything up. Okay, that's the first step. Just a very simple rectangle there. A rectangle is defined by its position and its size, obviously. And then what we want to do is head over back to the interface here. And what I want to do, instead of just doing it like this, is to define a array up here with all the rectangles that we do have. Then we can use them um, later on. And there's no reason to have like one set of rectangles for each instance of this interface. So I can just make it static. And I can also make it final. Uh, sorry. GUI rectangle. Because I'm just g the only thing I'm going to do is to set them in the beginning. Uh, like so. And that's will have to be called rectangles. But now it's going to complain like, alright, oh, this is final. You're not setting it. But we can use something called the static block here, or well, I don't know if it's called that, but if we type static here and then uh, brackets here, we can type code here that is going to be um, not executed with the constructor, but executed when, when the static fields are being um, uh, well created. So um, here I'm going to do this stuff where we create all the rectangles. So rectangles equals new GUI rectangle. How many? Well, I need 49, right? 7 by 7, that's 49. And then it's just a matter of filling these. And the filling part here, when we create them, we will do that once and only once. And the code for this one here is going to be fairly similar to when we actually drew, the, drew them before. For uh, int j equals 0. Like so. And when we've done that, it's just a matter of actually creating a rectangle. And we need to put that in rectangles, but which ID then? Well, it doesn't really matter too much how we calculate this. Uh, it doesn't matter of how we define like the IDs for these guys. So I'm just going to do I times 7 plus J. You could also do the opposite, like J times 7 plus I. That would be totally possible as well, and it would give the same results. But the important part is that we actually create this GI rectangle. like so. Um, and what we want to do here is obviously define the x, y, the width and the uh, height like so. And uh, we'll, we'll recognize this because here we go, 57 plus i times 9 uh, and later on we have 70 uh, not times plus j times 9 and finally 8 and 8. So you might recognize these guys because these are the same values that I had before. Or are they? Well Take a look here. We're adding GUI left and GUI top, but I didn't do that when I created a rectangle. Why? Well, in my opinion, it's very annoying that we always have to type these things. We don't use it for anything. Right? We just type it there and there and there and so on. So I'm going to create these, rec re these rectangles without ha bothering about adding the GUI left or GUI top. It's going to be much easier to work with, but we still have to uh, keep that in mind that we are actually not uh, considering that part. So what we'll have to do now is basically loop through the rectangles and draw them all. Okay, I'll leave this code now Now here as a reference. We're going to remove it in just a second. Okay, so we loop through all the rectangles. I remember we, we create that once, so we don't, we don't create it uh, one, one time 
each um, well each time we create an interface we just create it once and then we're done each one time per client and it's not going to matter they are, they are not going to move if we wanted them to move however then we would have to create them once per interface probably uh, but now when we have it like this what we can do is well just a similar thing but not really we don't have to define all of these things we might want to define a source source x equals zero not zero x size sorry like that and well I don't really think we need to define the y source here but what I w want to do is tell the rectangle how to detect if a coordinate is inside well within it basically so what I'm going to define here is public boolean indirect and this is going to be basically what we did before but in a method inside this uh, class here but um, I'm also going to ask for the machined UI okay but more importantly and what makes a bit more sense I guess is the coordinate of the mouse obviously we need to know that to check if it's within the rectangle that's the whole point here um, but um, why am I asking for the UI well since we we are not bothering about UI top and UI left when we uh, well when we create this rectangle but mouse the mouse X and mouse Y will contain the GUI top and GUI left as well because well if we click at the upper left corner of the interface we're not going to get zero zero we're going to get GUI left and GUI top as the the coordinate or well, not click but if the mouse is there so what we want to do is to keep that in mind when we do this calculation and to do so I'm just going to send along GUI and then we can use that to sort of take that into into consideration but uh, a bit unfortunate we can't really reach the um, the GUI's um, GUI top and GUI left so what we'll have to do here is just uh, have a little wrapper here so get left yeah some scope is just we, we don't have permission to reach them but we can write a method here uh, where we actually uh, reach them like so and ironically enough uh, these methods can have protected scope and the uh, the feeds here they have also protected scope yes because well protected means we can reach it from the same package or from a subclass and in the case of get top and get left we can reach them just because they are in the same package and in the case of GUI left and GUI top we can reach them within our interface because it's a subclass so just the, just wrappers there and now we get the magic here what we can just do is mouse x minus equals to um, gui dot get left mouse y minus equals gui dot get top like so and when we've done that what we can do is just do the, the proper code and that's the same thing that we did before but with new names so we have if the x of this is le uh, less than or equals to the mouse and the mouse is lesser than or equals to the uh, x plus the width so that's the right border and then we have that the y should be le lesser than mouse dot y and mouse dot y should be lesser than or equals to the the right uh, well not the right border the bottom border sorry so that's y plus the h like so so now we can very easily just check if the mouse is inside a corner uh, well inside the rectangle and we don't have to bother about get GUI top and GUI left so let's take a look on that um, here we go up here uh, so now it's just a matter of if all right sorry we need to get a rectangle as well uh, GUI rectangle rectangles uh, like so so now when we have the rectangle we can just do rect dot in rect like so give it the interface the x and the y there you go and if that's the case source source sorry x plus equals to 8 like so there you go so very simple uh, obviously we had to write that code but now we don't have to bother about it now we don't need to know how is the rectangle uh, collection uh, done we can just ask the rectangle itself is this uh, well are these coordinates here inside in well inside your bounds basically and we don't have to bother, bother about GUI left or GUI top either we just send along the interface and that's going to be handled right away 
Of course this is not necessary, but it's going to come very in handy when we start to make more, more advanced interfaces. Because when we make advanced interfaces it's important to, well, be able to keep track of, of everything yourself. Otherwise it's just going to fall apart. And, in, well, to continue with that, we, what we can do is yet head over to the GUI rectangle again and add another method. Like this. Public void draw. GUI machine. GUI, so we want to do uh, GUI there. We want the source X and the source Y, like so. There you go. And then we can just draw, draw this uh, uh, rectangle here. So GUI dot draw textured model rec there. And what do we want to give it? Well, remember when we want to draw it, we need to give it the uh, the left there plus the normal coordinate. And here we want to give it the uh, top plus the normal coordinate. And then we have the source and the uh, source there as well, and finally the width and the height, like so. So very simple now, we can just draw it, and here's where things becomes very easy. Now it's just a matter of doing rect.draw, we give it the interface, and the source x is source x there, which might be the x size, or 8 more there, and the source y is just 27. However, we want to draw something more as well. Well, we don't need this anymore. So now we have the same thing that we had before. So it's much shorter, in here, and we don't have to well write a lot of code to to fix it, and we can also reuse it later on, which we will take a look at in just a second. Because well, if we take a look in the texture, I have these two things here: the normal one and the one we can hover for. But I also have this green box here, and the whole point with this interface is that you can click, and it's going to be selected. And when it's selected, what we want to do is um, well show that, and then later on that's going to drop an anvil at that specific location. And what we want to do is well store that in the tile entity, obviously. So what I'm going to do is just head over to the tile entity. I need to open that tile entity machine and create an a array here as a public. I'm going to make it public. Uh, we can make it final as well. Public final. Um, what should I call it? Well, I need to give it a type. Custom setup. Uh, like so. And then uh, custom setup equals uh, new boolean. And those has to be, uh, well, the length has to be 49, obviously. So we're going to use that one uh, quite soon, but we'll see the first thing here. We can just do it like this. So if custom setup, oh uh, sorry, machine dot custom setup, like so, and we refer to I there, the rectangle we're currently at. So if that's the case, if that is set, we want to draw the inner thing as well. Okay, is that tricky? No. Uh, size 35. There you go. Done. So just because they have the same size, I draw it uh, a bit smart here, I draw it uh, in the same location, just further down here, and I have a transparent border. So it, just because I have a transparent border, it doesn't matter if we draw it, just because, well, it's transparent, so therefore we'll see the border that is left, uh, whether it's grey or white, like so. So. Uh, there you go, now we can draw it once, we can draw it again very easily. So we can refer to the location here, we don't really have to bother exactly where it is, we can just tell it to draw itself. Which comes, which brings us to the next part. When we click it, we obviously want to do something with it, right? Okay, so how do we do that? How do we detect that some, something has been clicked? Well, what we're going to do is refer to another method here, called mouse clicked. So this comes very in handy when we want to make more advanced things, because then we can detect things ourselves when, when they are being clicked. So we get X, we get Y, and finally we get, what do we get? Well, we get a button. And that, this is zero if it's a left click and one if it's a right click. I believe it's two for a middle mouse click, but I'm not entirely sure because I haven't used that part of it. Uh, but if you want to scrolling, you can do that in another way. Uh, so we just get it there, and now we can check if you collect one of these um, um, rectangles. And it's fairly simple. You should know how. So we, we loop through the rectangles. So this is what I meant. Now we don't have to redefine their, their uh, bounds just because we, we loop through again. We have them stored uh, in this array called rectangles of the, of the class type GUI 
uh, rectangle. So the only thing we'll have to do is just grab the current rectangle like this. And when that is sorted, then we can check if um, well, these coordinates here are within that rectangle. And if so, that means that you clicked it. And if you clicked it, we want to break out of the loop, because if we clicked one, then we didn't click any other one. But what do we want to do here? This is obviously just on the, on the client side. So to send it to the server side, what we'll have to do is send a packet. Packet handler, and we could define a d different type of packet. We've seen that we've done that before. But if we want to, we can to just save some time. We can hijack the send button packet because this is sort of a button anyway. And we're already using um, ID zero and ID one there from before. So let's use two. Come on, two plus the i i there. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what's going on here. There you go. So we just send that along, the server will receive it, and then we can do something with it. Okay? Just because we have an array here of all the rectangles, it's very easy to check if it's within oh, um, that rectangle, the mouse coordinate there. So we don't have to do the same ca calculation again, or well, we do the same calculation again, of course, but we don't have to specify that in code, we don't have to type it, so it's very easy to change. Head over to the tile into the machine, and this is where we receive the uh, button click. If if you remember, here receive button event. So if it's something else, here default, like so, then we might want to do button ID minus equals to two. Remember we added two uh, on the client side, and then we can do something with it. Uh, what I'm going to do is fairly simple. I'm just going to do custom setup button ID like so equals not custom setup button ID. So I'm basically just going to reverse the value of the thing we clicked on. So basically going back and forth between the um, um, uh, well, if, if it's filled or not, sorry. And then what we can do is just to print out this, just to have some debugging here. Print uh, line, and what I'm going to t uh, print out is the new value, so custom setup, like so. And you might realize why I need to actually print it out here to see something. Why is that? Have you figured it out? Well, let's start and take a look. Well, basically why I'm doing it is because, well, we, we take the information from the client side, we send it to the server, the server is doing something with it, but there it stops. We're not sending it back to the client or anything, so the client won't be able to show anything. But if I go into the uh, larger screen here, so you can see, if I click on uh, here, for instance, it's going to say true, like that. But if I click on the same thing again, it's going to say false because I reverted it back. Whereas if I click on this one first, true, and that one true, true, true. So it seems to be working somewhat. It seems to remember and it seems to do a difference between them. It's a bit tricky to see of course, but um, that's where the next part comes in. How do we synchronize this? And well, we could say, alright, we send a packet, you know, that might be good when we receive the information, we send a packet to the client, but then we have the problem, what happens if the client is not logged in when this happens? It could be another one that is changing this. Should we send it when it logs in? Should we send it when it comes nearby? Like, what should we do? Should we, if we use a client event, when should we send those? When should we receive those? We could use metadata. Well, we can't really, that would be very weird. So, how do we do this? How do we do the synchronization here when it comes to information in an interface? And that's, that's the keyword here, information in an interface. If we have information in an interface, when do we need to send it? Well, we only need to send it to players having the interface open. And when should we send, send a lot of information? Well, when the player opens the inter interface, because when the player opens the interface, we need to give it all the information it requires, and then when it still has it open, we want to update it continuously uh, when, when the information has been changed. And we have something for that. There's something uh, that we can use for that, and the class we're going to use to 
fix that is the container. So we can use the container to synchronize this data. The container itself usually synchronizes a lot of these uh, things already. For instance, all the items. Remember, we have had a machine dropping anvils, right? And the anvils, they are dropped on the server side. When we take a look on the anvils, well, the, the inventory basically on the client side, it's going, it will have updated. It has been updated with the amount of anvils that we dropped. So why is that? Well, they have been synchronized through the container. And the same thing goes with the furnace, for instance. W with the furnace, we have an ember, well, the vanilla furnace, an ember that tells us how much fuel we have left before it's going to consume another piece of fuel. And we have an arrow that is continuously moving uh, that is t telling us how, well, how long the progress has been, well, going, basically, uh, of, of the current item. And that needs to be synchronized to the client as well. The client needs to know it if the client has it open, the interface. So that's basically the synchronization part here. We send things to players when they open it, the interface, and we, well, send it when they have the, it opened. If they don't have it opened, there's no reason to send it. Okay, to do this we need three methods. Um, we need um, add crafting to crafters. We need uh, update progress bar. And we need detect and send changes. Obviously, I'm going to go through all of these, what they do in detail. Um, I might not have time to go through detect and send changes before the break, but if so, I'm just going to go through it after the break instead. Here we go. When we add crafting to crafter, that basically means that, well, when a player opens the uh, interface, what do we want to send uh, to it? Well, what, we, what do we want to do? This is on the server side. Here, we receive some information, and this is on the client side, uh, ID and data, like so. And this is, well, if we want to continuously send information to the players that have this interface opened. Okay, so first of all, let's um, do the add crafter, crafting to crafters. And what we want to do here is just loop through all the information that we want to send and just send it to the, the player that we just added. I know it's a, a something called iCrafting, and that's basically the, the uh, thing that have the uh, interface opened, which is basically a player. So that's why I'm calling it a player, even though it's of the type I crafting here. Um, so uh, here we go, and i equals zero. i is less than machine. Remember, we have the machine stored up here. We always store it like so. There it is. Uh, machine dot custom setup dot length like that. And just a matter of increasing it like so. So I'm basically looping through all the, the the data that we do have. Then it's just a matter of doing player dot send something do something here called send progress bar update. And this is the same thing that the um, furnace uses for for sending the progress or the how much fuel we have left and so so on. Um, and then we first of all you just want to give it the um, uh, this container, then an ID, and then the data. And the data I'm going to send is machine dot custom setup uh, i. And if this is true, then I want to send a one, otherwise a zero. So I want to note uh, here that this is not in any way at all a good way of sending it. That doesn't mean that it's a bad way of doing like player dot send progress bar update. What I'm referring to here is that we send a boolean as a zero or a one when we have 49 booleans to send. What we could do is to compress them. And to do so, we need to know a bit about bit operators and things like that, binary and stuff. And that's going to be a part of the uh, sixth course, the one about bits and pieces. So just because we haven't learned that yet, I'm not going to be able to do it in a more efficient way than this. Uh, we would still use play.sendProgress bar update, so there's nothing wrong with that part. You can think about it like, all right, you want to carry a ton of things from, from your house to your, to your friend's house over the road. Then if you just grab everything in your arms and go, it's obviously going to work. You, you're using the same path to get there. You, you walk down the stairs, across uh, the road, up the fri uh, friend's stairs to, to that person's room or whatnot, and drop the things there. And then you go back and uh, grab some more, which it works, but you will have to go a lot of, of time. But if you pack it properly in a, like a nice box or some bags or something like that, you might not just have to go there four times. And that's basically what we have here. We could send four, 
you use this send progress bar update four times rather than 49 times if we do it properly. But like I said, we use the same mechanics, we still walk across the road, but we have to do it a lot of lot of times more just yes, because we don't uh, pack it properly. Uh, but for now it's going to be totally fine. And then we, when we do play it at send progress bar update, what will happen is that it's going to be sent to the client side and we're going to receive it here on update progress bar. Um, we will receive the ID, that's the ID there, and the data which we send here. And like I said at the moment, we send it a bit inefficient, but it's going to work for now. And the data and ID here, I know it says int here, so it's an integer, it takes up four bytes, pretty large numbers, up to two millions or whatnot. But we can't use that big of uh, that big numbers. We can use them as shorts, so they should be shorts here, but we can't make them short, uh, well type short here, because for some reason they are integers, but if you use numbers that are bigger than shorts, it's not going to work. It's not going to be synchronized. It's It can't send bigger numbers than shorts. So just keep that in mind. Even though it's asking for int an integer here, and we're receiving an integer here, if you send them bigger than shorts, they are not going to reach the destination. Um, okay, so what we want to do here is just use the value. Ma machine dot custom setup at the ID location. Oops, sorry. ID like so, and then we want to set it to data is not equal to zero. So what we have here is basically, uh, if it was true here, we sent a one. If we received a one, then one is not equal to zero, and therefore we uh, set machine or custom setup to true. If machine or custom setup here was false, then we sent a zero, and zero is not equal, to not not equal to zero, and therefore we will. Um, get this as false. So basically we send it on the server side like this and then re we receive it on the client side like so. So let's take a look on that. There you go. Right. So now, if we, um, sorry, if I click, if I click there, 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 and there, and then open it again, boom, there you go. So it didn't synchronize right away, but if I clicked on something, uh, I click on a few here, like so, and then I close it and open it again, it's going to look like that. If I click on this top one and the bottom one, close it and open it again, those would be ha have been deselected. So what's going on here? Why is it not synchronizing all the time? Well, let's take a look in the code. What we're doing here is when the player is opening the interface, we synchronize all the information that we have. We just loop through the whole array and send all of that. But like I've said before, we send it 49 times, we could send it just four times, uh, but you know, we don't have any proper bags to pack it in. Not yet. Um, and then we just receive it on the client side. So we send it when the uh, player opens the interface and then retrieves it. So the problem what we have here is we don't send it uh, at other times than than when we have, well, you know, uh, opened the interface. So we want to send it even when the interface is opened and, well, it's probably quite obvious what we're going to use for that. So we're going to use the text and send changes to see if we, something is new. If something is new, then what we want to do is to send that information to the client as well. And it's just a matter of sending it because as soon as the client receives it, it's going to receive it here as well. And therefore, uh, it's just going to use the information properly. But like I said, that's going to be after the break. Yes, because we don't have time at the moment. So after the break, I will continue and we'll make sure that it's going to update right away. But that's in 15 minutes, so goodbye.